Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the MLA Sheep Productivity and Profitability webinar series. And this is the second webinar uh, that we're running as part of the series in 2018. And we've got a, a number to come. Uh, tonight's webinar is on um, prime lamb business performance. It's a 2017 Home Sacket benchmark update. Uh, my name's David Brown and I work for the MLA um, webinar conveners Home Sacket and I'll also be delivering this webinar this evening. For those who are new to the webinar platform, just quickly, you've got this uh, control panel in the top, probably right hand side of your screen. Um, just hit that red button there if you want to collapse the control panel so it doesn't cover tonight's presentation. Um, you're muted. I can't hear you, but hopefully you can hear us. And that questions box is where you need to put any questions or comments that you have about tonight's webinar. And I'd even appreciate if some people um, put in what the weather's doing in their part of the woods this evening so that I know you can hear us and, and that you know where the questions box is. Before I move on, next week we've got another webinar. It's going to be delivered by Mr. Tim Prance from South Australia, and that webinar is going to be focusing on developing a fertiliser program for the year ahead to maximise prime land productivity. So that webinar is going to be next week uh, on a day to be confirmed, but keep an eye on your text messages and your emails, and I'll provide you with that detail as soon as I can. So let's move straight on to tonight, the content of tonight's webinar. Now I appreciate that some people here uh, may be short on time, so let's get straight to the nuts and bolts. Uh, I wanted to provide what we, Home Sackett, uh, suggest are what a top 20 performance or profitability prime, la prime lamb flock should be aiming for on a range of key performance indicators. Uh, so your first target in a prime lamb operation would be to be, be producing 20 kilos of dressed, dressed lamb per hectare per 100 mil of rain. So a quick conversion uh, for simplicity would be if you're a, a 600 mil rainfall zone, you need to be producing, uh, I think that's 120 kilos per hectare of dressed lamb. Another target which is a per head productivity measure, is nine kilos of dressed lamb per DSE. This has historically been a strong uh, performance, a strong, uh, has a strong correlation with prime lamb flock profitability. And uh, some of the best guys are doing, and girls are doing up to 10 kilos, but we like to think that nine kilos is a, a healthy target. Target three would be to be joining one U per hectare per 100 mil of rainfall. Uh, that would be including your ewe lambs if you are a self-replacing flock. And we find this here is one of the most tangible and simple prime lamb key performance indicators for producers to take home and use in their, um, in, in their flocks. Uh, is it, it's, it's definitely uh, something that you can calculate quite quickly and uh, put into action if, if, your, if your land type uh, allows it. Uh, the fourth target would be to be producing around about 120% lambs wean per ewe joined. We don't see any huge increase in profits uh, if people are producing 130% or more lambs. Uh, generally, this is because that the nutritional requirements to reach these high levels of fertility uh, begin to erode um, the number of ewes that can be joined per hectare per 100 mil. And it, and it subsequently reduces um, sheep run per hectare and, and, and kilos of lamb produced um, per hectare. Uh, target five is 280 grams per day of lamb growth rate to sale. Now, that's not a measurement that we collect uh, specifically uh, due to the complexity of, of trying to uh, analyze specific lamb growth rates over such a wide number of um, 
farms. However, some studies that we've done shows that if you have the whole of your drop averaging 280 grams per day through to the point of sale, um, uh, this would be quite a you know quite a good uh, target and uh, and not often achieved even though we do hear industry quotes of three to four even higher uh, 100 grams of growth rate uh, coming from lambs but often when you go over the whole flock uh, these uh, and uh, including the laggards this is not often the case for a commercial prime lamb operation target six it's a simple one is to have a majority lamb sold before the partial quality declines. Now, some people manipulate that partial quality curve in their operations by uh, putting in summer, uh, summer brassicas, chicory, lucin, or other types of high quality summer pastures. Um, now, uh, those need to be considered uh, because they're quite expensive and whether or not they are actually allowing you to turn off uh, those lambs cost effectively or finish those lambs cost effectively needs to be weighed up against uh, your lambing date um, because if you have your lambing date suitably placed then you should be aiming to get a majority of, of your lambs sold before your season your seasonal partial quality declines and in quite a lot of places that sim is simply you know uh, if you're in the dry parts November uh, or even October or November, but if you're in the high rainfall areas, could be Christmas or, or just after. Um, the last target, which which it is supposed to be target seven, um, is to have your cost structure per DSC for prime lambs hovering around that $32 per DSC. Uh, so that uh, so if you look at uh, the DSCs per U, um, which we often, you know, if, depending on, uh, you know, the flock structure and your finishing timing, lambing rates, uh, you may be about two and a half DSC. Uh, so that would equate to an $81 of it spending money per ewe joined, and that's inclusive of ewe lambs. So before we push on this evening, I'd like to quickly outline where a lot of this data and these benchmarks are coming from. Homesacket is uh, a, a benchmarking, among other professional pursuits, uh, is a benchmarking organisation and we collect data from a wide range of mixed farming and livestock enterprises throughout South East New South Wales. Um, in 2017 we benchmarked 57 prime lamb flocks uh, across uh, across South Australia, and New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania and, and Flinders Island. And those red dots uh, depict where each of those flocks have come from. Now, a prime lamb flock is specifically a crossbred or composite ewe joined to a composite or terminal ram, turning off lambs destined uh, for the sale yards or for the slaughter. It excludes any what we call dual purpose flock, which is a merino ewe joined to a terminal or maternal sire. Even though they are producing lambs, um, just to keep tonight's webinar as simple as possible, they've been excluded from the analyses and all the benchmarks and targets that we are discussing tonight relate specifically to uh, prime lamb operation. The 2017 flock characteristics would, could be said that uh, is a mix of maternal and terminal size and composite and first cross use. The median rainfall of the prime lamb database was 680 millimetres and in 2017 they received 12% more uh, than their long term average. The median use joined per flock is 2300. The main month of lambing is August and 70% of the flocks are self-replacing and that there has been an inter interesting uh, phenomenon. Uh, there has been an increasing trend towards self-replacing flocks over the last few years. So in 2017, the prime land performance, we had income 
at $53 per DSE, expenses at $39 per DSE, leaving us with a profit of $16 per DSE, which is actually a 44% increase on the 2016 year. Production was 8.3 kilograms of dressed weight per DSE. Cost of production was at $4.70 per kilogram of dressed weight produced. And price received was $6.20 per kilogram of dress weight sold. And that graph on the right there shows the percentage change on 2016. So you can see there's been an over 5% increase on income, almost a 5% decrease on expenses per DSE, about a 4% increase in production, that's lamb kilograms of dress weight per DSE. And those factors combined, expenses, an in increase in production, a decrease in expenses, led to a, quite a dramatic decrease in cost of production, 10% um, decrease in cost of production, and all and 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 this coupled with an increase in pr price received of almost 12% has obviously led to a pretty remarkable increase, 44% uh, increase in profit per DSE in 2017. So on to a few interesting uh, bits of data that I'd like to present to you this evening. Historically, prime land profits uh, are good um, in 2017, but they're not the best. We need to consider why this is. So you can see there that's net profit dollars per DSE stretching from 2008 through to uh, the 2017 year. Now, 2011 was the best year by far out of those uh, that that uh, cohort um, with 2017 uh, the third best uh, and then uh, once again to 2015 that was the second best why it's not historically the best year despite such good prices is that i believe that your cost of production is stealing your profit margins what we can see here is over the last 20 years, since 1998, the blue line depicts prime land price received, uh, dollars per kilogram of dressed weight, and the red line depicts prime lamb cost of production, uh, kilograms of dressed weight uh, of lamb. Now you can see that they've been going up in unison, and even though uh, we've been receiving and, uh, sorry, even though prime land prices have been increasing, the cost of production has been increasing as well, uh, almost at the same rate. And to the extent that in 2013, mm. the industry, uh, well, this database in particular, um, only just broke even. And it's only been um, a rebound in land prices back up to the lofty heights of 2011 that have seen the prime lamb enterprise start to generate the profit margins again. But they are definitely not uh, at the same level as they were in 2011. And as if you look back along that chart, uh, that profit margin per kilogram of lamb is, uh, has been just as good back in 2002, 2003, 2004, 2010, 11, and even 2012. So what we can, what we see is that prime land prices are increasing, and prices are indeed uh, quite good. But there has been uh, also a commensurate increase in in cost of production. The reason will, there'd be a, a stark uh, drop in cost of production from 2016 to 17, I predict, is due to um, supplementary feeding expenses from a, a few of the areas represented in this database having a, a tight a tight time in 2016, uh, resulting in higher cost production. This year will be interesting to those who are concentrating on their cost production and those who may be running a beef herd alongside their lamb operation. What we can see here is that a percentage change in cost of production of both the lamb enterprise and the beef enterprise has benchmarked by home sackets since 1998 through to the 2017 
benchmarking year. And my comment to, to the audience this evening is, have the high prices um, been enjoyed by the prime land industry as a whole, bred complacency and resulted in uh, us allowing the prime land cost of production to increase over time. Uh, you'll see there that where beef has only increased uh, 50% on its cost of production since 1998, um, prime lamb production, prime lamb enterprise has increased by 150% since 1998. Now, the beef industry has had a bit of a revolution in its price received over the last two or so years. And what it will need to keep an eye on is that its cost of production doesn't start to creep up as it has done with the lamb industry and swallow up those profit margins. Uh, so the key message coming from that is that, yeah, that although we are probably pushing production and investing in our prime lamb, prime lamb enterprises, what it seems as though, uh, sorry, if we're pushing production by investing and spending more on our prime lamb operations is that those production gains aren't sufficient enough to or uh, aren't sufficient enough to keep our cost production low i.e um, the marginal cost in some instances will have exceeded the marginal gain in production and that's resulted in an inflating cost of production and either just maintaining or even losing some of the profit margin per kilo um, over time And the concerning thing about prime lambs closing gap between price received and cost production is that is it losing the race in the competition for land against the competing enterprises? This graph here shows the relativity of prime land performance to four other key broadacre enterprises as benchmarked by Home Sackett. As a percentage basis, you can see that prime lamb has actually, and, and sorry, and that has done, been done on a 10-year average to date, five-year average to date, and a one-year average, which is 2017. And what you can see there is that prime lamb has, in fact, been uh, less profitable than all the other competing broadacre um broadacre enterprises on all uh, time spans 10, 5 and 1 year. You can see that dual purpose, admittedly dual purpose uh, enjoys a combination of both wool and lamb income and has historically outperformed all the other livestock uh, livestock enterprises in, in, uh, in most years. Uh, but wool has outperformed lamb in each time bracket, beef has outperformed lamb and especially crop. So what we need to be thinking about as an industry now is that if we don't uh, start to manage our lamb cost of production and retrieve some of the profit margin that's been eaten up by high cost of production, uh, then it's going to slowly lose ground against these competing enterprises. If we look at land production per hectare from 2008 through to 2017, it tells a story of no real increase. And we believe that that is actually constraining land profitability. And that's in spite of the genetic progress, uh, advances in, in our knowledge around ewe management for fertility, uh, increases in pasture, uh, science and production quality and and uh, and better management systems but it hasn't converted into more weight of lamb produced per hectare and if we dig a little bit deeper and look at kilograms of lamb per hectare per hundred millimeters of year analyzed rainfall from 2008 to 2017 what we can see there is almost a decline in in the production over those 10 year period it's it's very important that we uh, well sorry as per the title it's not always easy to turn rain into kilograms of lamb but we do need to try it, 
by in maintaining or, or increasing our land production per hectare by 100 mil of rainfall, we are in fact be, becoming more flexible at managing our, our stocking rate, managing our production and meeting the, uh, meeting the rainfall uh, meeting the rain, the rainfall challenge, I'd like to put it, and that if we have the uh, product, if we have the partial production in front of us, we need to learn how to use it, and if the rainfall cuts out, we need to learn how to manage our systems, um, to uh, you know, to minimise losses, and to uh, maintain uh, the production or maintain a suitable level of production relative to the season. Historically, production per DSC, which is depicted in this graph here, has been a very uh, strong predictor of profit, profitability per DSC in prime lamb operations. And from 2008 to 2017, we can see uh, that kilograms of lamb produced uh, per DSC has been hovering around that six to eight kilos in most years uh, with a uh, uh, with a, a, a peak in 2010 and a, the doldrums through 2012 to 2014 and uh, a, a re-emergence of, of per DSE productivity in lambs in 2017. Now, I'm going to focus on this this evening and, and make a few more comments that I would like you to keep in mind this uh, seemingly static uh, level of productivity per DSC in lambs, despite recent increases, um, but uh, we aren't actually yet back to the uh, to the same level we were in 2010. And we're going to dig a little bit deeper into what might be driving or res restricting uh, this level of profit uh, productivity per DSC. Weaning percentage. Will, is, a, is a key performance indicator that will affect productivity per DSC. As weaning percentage increases, uh, we do adjust the estimated feed consumption of the ewes in our benchmarking, but because the ewes are only pregnant and lactating for a portion of the year, even though we do increase their DSC rating for those periods, uh, the rest of the year, their DSE rating as a dry ewe remains the same, you know, irrespective of whether they produce 80% of lambs weaned or whether they produce 150% lambs weaned. So what that means is that as uh, fertility or weaning percentage increases, so too will productivity per DSE. Uh, as more DSE uh, uh, or more kilograms of lamb uh, are weaned, uh, per DSE of, of, of you run. However, despite the rising weaning percentages, uh, we haven't actually seen an increase in production per, per DSE. So what I'd like to uh, suggest is that, uh, oh, and another, and another a piece of information that we haven't actually graphed, but there has been, similar to weaning percentage, there's been a slight increase in um, or, or trend towards higher lamb sale weights, presumably to meet uh, markets that are demanding uh, higher lamb sale weights over time. And what this means is that uh, with higher lamb sale weights and a general increase in weaning percentages, one would expect uh, had growth rate to sale remain the same that obviously production per DSE will have increased. However, we haven't seen this level of increase in production per DSE. So we're getting uh, larger animals, we're getting higher weaning percentages and no increase in production per DSE. The only rational uh, reason for this that we can come to uh, without uh, collecting the data specifically is that growth rates to sale are not getting better uh, and, and in fact could be slowing down um, not due to genetic uh, regress or, 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 or lack of genetic gain but because lambs are being held for longer and longer and uh, 
presumably held on to poorer quality pastures and and that as soon as that happens and uh, lambs are held on held on to uh, for to meet a, a higher a higher spec market or a higher weight spec market uh, these growth rates to sale uh, drum it, uh, plummet dramatically and we can see uh, that those lambs sold before the end of the uh, partial quality curve often meet uh, the 200 and uh, I think it was 70 or 80 uh, grams per day and often above 350 grams per day of uh, average daily weight gain. But those lambs that are held over the Christmas period and sold into the market, uh, into the markets uh, after the partial quality curve uh, drops, um, those lambs often have markedly reduced growth rates, uh, 200 grams a day, even back to 150 grams away a day to the point of sale. Uh, what this does, this actually draws down productivity per DSC because those lambs have been held and counted as obviously DSCs within the flock for a long period and are in effect competing with the next year's production, competing with the ewes, uh, the ewes that could be run um, to produce the next year's lambs crop. And, and as a result, and a dropping productivity per DSE. So uh, if there's a priority for the industry at the moment, it will be to, uh, to obviously maintain uh, weaning rates uh, uh, at where they are. However, we need to start to focus on lamb growth rate and, and time to turn off those lambs so we can, we're not competing with the next, uh, with the ewes uh, that are there to produce the next crop of lambs and we're getting them off in good time and preferably most of them before the partial quality curve uh, drops off. The result is that production isn't increasing uh, but expenses are. On the left hand axis there we've got prime lamb production, kilograms of carcass weight per hectare per 100 mil of rainfall. That's the green bars uh, with a trend line, the green dotted uh, linear line. And the expenses per hectare per 100 mil of rainfall is the red line, the red, uh, the red solid line, and that's depicted, um, uh, or sorry, that's levelled against the right hand axis there, prime lamb expenses, dollars per hectare per 100 mil. So, uh, and the red dotted line there is the, is the linear trend of expenses per hectare per 100 mil. And as you can see, it's quite clear that over the last 20 years, the expenses per hectare per 100 mil have been rising at a far greater rate than production per hectare per 100 mil of rainfall, which is a concern for the industry and, uh, and, and definitely a trend that needs to be uh, uh, corrected at, uh, as soon as possible. So cost of production in theory, uh, most the priority for uh, lamb systems at the moment or in general, is that they focus on trying to achieve um, productivity gains, uh, those productivity gains in the business that come cheaply and preferably for free. Um, this graph here shows cost of production and production kilograms of death weight per hectare per 100 mil of rainfall. Now, this here will help, hopefully, uh, help, uh, help me depict this point. Now, I'll just, uh, excuse me. So this lot, dotted line here depicts a business, um, uh, a business, a certain business's relationship, uh, prime lamb enterprise um, production's relationship with cost production on the left-hand axis there, i.e. Um, with a high, uh, you know, with low production, we have a high cost production, obviously, because overheads in a business contribute, you know, between 40 and, and 60, even 70 percent of the overhead cost structure. So we're producing too few kilos of lamb to defray the overhead costs and result in a high cost production. As you travel down that line, those dotted lines, we can see that we, as we increase production, um, we decrease cost production to a point beyond which uh, production. Uh, be, beyond beyond which point in production, cost production actually starts to rise again. What this point means is that after that point, um, the slow uh, our cost production starts to rise because the uh, the investment into production 
is, um, or the actual the capital employed to generate that production is not um, is uh, is not producing the same level of production as it was back towards the left along that curve. So we got two businesses right. One business here has a cost production curve in the blue, which is you know, on the left is turned to red, uh, but as you can see, as it passes that, that low point, it starts to rise slowly. But this second business, that's system one, and this system two, once it passes that point, uh, the lowest cost of production, and it, start, it keeps pushing production, its cost of production rises much quicker. What, what this here is depicting are two different businesses, one business that is chasing production uh, through uh, finding the you know uh, cost effective and low hanging fruit i.e they might be increasing past utilization they might be making better use of existing labor resources or they're maybe even shifting uh, certain elements of the production system lambing date um, or time of turn off uh, so that they uh, can increase production without the uh, convention increasing costs. However, system two is a business that is increasing production um, in a, probably a, a non-cost effective manner, i.e. they are beginning to feed lot lambs or they are investing heavily into um, summer crops, which, you know, in effect, is the same as feedlotting, in, in some senses, uh, the same as feedlotting lambs. And, and those last few kilos, from 15 kilos up to 25 um, per hectare, 100 mil, they're coming at quite an expense and actually pushing cost production up to higher levels. So what, what, what that should be uh, pushing us to, to consider is that how are we, uh, as an industry, going to increase production uh, without the commensurate increase in cost production. We need to find cost effective ways to increase production on our farms without blowing out cost production and undoing the uh, uh, the good work and, and eroding profit margin uh, all the you know while in the process of increasing production. Um, I haven't got time for this graph here, but it's not really important. I just wanted to show you this here. Um, in 2017, I've extracted the main cost structures, uh, labour and labour related costs uh, and feed based costs have been the biggest contributors to lamb, prime lamb enterprises. And so the feed base uh, has contributed to $8 per DSC, uh, labour to $14 per DSC and, uh, and then the next, uh, and in, in included in labour uh, should be machinery as well. So machinery is what we would call as a labour related expense. So between uh, labour and labour related expenses which are machinery and feed base they contribute to a majority of the cost structure of a prime lamb operation. Just quickly I've got a, a few slides here on the top prime lamb flocks uh, as uh, over the last um, sorry five years there's seven flocks in this uh, as you can see there there's a, a quick picture uh, depicting where those flocks are coming from. Uh, that, that map there shows prime lamb flocks. It does show dual purpose flocks as well, uh, but they've been omitted from the analysis. It's just a red pin, so two from Tasmania, one from Flinders Island, and three from uh, a mixture of the uh, southern, uh, southern Tablelands and the um, probably Central West or, or the or Central Tablelands there. What you can see though is that when you compare those flocks, those top seven prime lamb flocks, the averages over the last five years compared to the rest, uh, they've produced a little bit on a per DSC and a per hectare basis, they've produced a little bit more income per DSC, uh, they've had the same expense structure per DSC, they've had this uh, a little, uh, you know, much lower overhead cost structure per DSC. 20% um, less, and that's resulted in 120% more profit per DSC than the average. And a similar story can be said per hectare, except they've actually produced uh, a more, a relatively more income per hectare, about 25% there, close to 30%. They've had the more enterprise expenses per hectare, obviously because uh, the increased income has come at a higher enterprise expenses. 
they've done it with this, exactly the same overhead cost structure, which is uh, which is uh, important to consider, and that's resulted into uh, close to 120% increase in, in profit per hectare. And how they did it? This graph here could be a almost a spot the difference graph. It's a range of key performance indicators. Those top seven flocks over the last five years have produced for have have managed to produce uh, their their lamb uh, with four dollars less labour and labour related expenses per DSE, which has been one of the major standout um, contributors to their high profitability. They have spent over two dollars more than the average on feed base. Now those feed base costs will include. Um, Fertilizer, supplementary feeding, adjustment, seed, uh, contract chemicals, um, and grazing on uh, fodder crops, and even adjustment. So basically, they've been spending more on feeding their stock per hectare or per DSE, uh, but they're spending much less on labor and labor related expenses. Now, as for the rest of the KPIs, they're very minimal gains made there by those top seven land producers. Um, you can see only 50 cents, maybe 50 cents less per DSC uh, than the rest for admin insurance, R&M per DSC, animal health, selling costs, freight and land care, and even a little bit, spending a little bit more on shearing, crutching, but minimal. So you can see where the, the biggest gains have been made. Um, that's obviously a, a reduction in labour and labour related expenses, but uh, an increase in feed base expenses, which would be leading to higher productivity. Yeah. So the top seven, how do they do it? They focus on generating more income per hectare than per DSE. They can maintain a higher income per DSE than the rest with a lower cost structure. They have higher enterprise expenses per hectare and then per DSE. Uh, to generate more production per hectare and they do have similar overhead cost structures per hectare but to fray them over more DSCs which obviously lowers the overheads. So summing up tonight I'd like everyone to be considering what their plan ahead for the 2018 production season is. Um, have you got uh, enough ewes to join one per hectare per 100 mil of rainfall? Let's just have a think about this. That's If you have a 700 mil rainfall that means you um, you need to be joining, um, oh, excuse me, that's, that's a mistake. It's, it's not supposed to be 14 ewes, uh, one per hectare of mil rainfall. So you need to be joining uh, four, uh, so seven ewes uh, per hectare. And uh, that sort of makes the rest of that calculation wrong. Apologies for that. But uh, yeah, so when you consider that, um, needs to be uh, seven ewes, 81.1 kilograms a day. So you're looking at roughly eight kilograms of dry matter required per day. Uh, so will you be using gibberellic acid? Will you be using urea? Are you gonna erode body condition score or, or erode dry matter residual? Is your country up for it? Some some land types aren't, uh, some pasture, pastures aren't. Um, and what can be invested to to bring uh, that, lamb, that land into, into, uh, into production? Lambing date, will you get the most of your lamb sold before the feed quality declines? Uh, is your costs, uh, have they been budgeted ahead based on the number of ewes you join? Uh, do you, have you been considering what your your cost reduction curve looks like? Uh, are, are you a low cost producer? Uh, have you got room to invest in production cost effectively to increase production without the commensurate increase in cost production? Or is your system a system that's backed into a corner and is, isn't able to invest uh, as a maximum production now and every dollar you spend on it, uh, will, will, uh, the production will be gobbled up or the value of the production will be gobbled up by the expenses uh, invested in it. And don't forget to implement, plan your events, have a, 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 a calendar uh, so you make sure you implement the, the things on time through the year ahead. You have to look for the efficiencies, you, um, especially around labour, uh, uh, omit recreational farming, and the uh, and the reason for that is you can take the kids to the snow instead. So that's the webinar for tonight. I'd like to um, invite 
the audience to start putting some questions in the questions box there. I'll stay in line for as long as we need to answer them. Um, before we head off though, I'm going to um, let you know about next week's webinar. We've got Tim Prance from South Australia. He's going to be delivering on uh, building a fertility plan for the year ahead or, or, or for, for the years ahead, uh, focusing on maximising productivity. Uh, fertility is the backbone of high performance pastures and actually one of the things we need to be considering when we, when we, when we think about our seemingly poor lamb growth rate to sale, we might have the genetics there but do we have the pastures, do we have the dry matter production and the quality of dry matter to allow those genetics to express themselves. So we need to be uh, thinking about our fertility of our pastures and, uh, and how we can invest in them um, smartly to increase our prime land productivity. Keep an eye on your uh, email and, and text and I'll be sending you more details about this uh, as that time approaches. And uh, at the end of tonight's webinar, I expect a few people will want to head, uh, head off to bed. Uh, please take part in the post webinar survey. It's very important we take particular notice of it and and uh, we use it to sort of guide our uh, future webinars, topics, how they're run, and MLA take it at a more strategic level and helps them uh, determine where they invest their, their next uh, industry dollar into extension, um, uh, into extension back to the public. So, okay, got a few questions coming here. Uh, got, got one from Charles Kay. Thank you, Charles. Um, what profit per DSC are the top producers making? Um, profit per DSC of the, of the top producers, Charles, just give me one second, I'll pull that up for you. Thanks, Charles. Good question. I'm just uh, finding that there. I, know, I appreciate I provided you with all the relativity figures, but nothing, um, no hard, hard, uh, no, no abs absolutes for the top seven. So the top seven producers over the last five years, uh, their profits haven't been corrected. So that's uh, that's nominal. Um, they've been averaging seventeen dollars eighty-five, or let's just say eighteen dollars worth of profit per DSC. And as we saw. Um, the average in 2017, uh, what was that? That was um, in 2017, the average was $16. So they've been, um, even though the average is 44% in 2017 over 2016, uh, $16 per DSC, uh, those top producers have been averaging $18 per DSC over the last five years, um, which, is, which when you add it up, um, in regards to a marginal profit over the average of the database over that period, it's fairly impressive. Another question here um, from Colin, uh, so Colin down at Holbrook. Good to hear you on online night, uh, tonight, Colin. Thanks for participating and, and supporting the webinars. David, are there are there any main expenses that have been increasing over the years contributing to the trend of rising cost production? Colin, it's a good question. Now, um, the key, y yes, there has been, and uh, and it's no different to what I presented before. Uh, the major cost structure is labour, and labour has been one of the key contributors to the increase in in cost. Of producing lamb over the lap, you know, over over the period of the benchmarking data set. So um, they've all contributed to a certain extent, uh, but I think labour has definitely been the biggest contributor. Now, is that a scale issue? Is it a, is it a, is it a is it a, uh, a complacency issue? You know, back to that high price received and and prime lamb producers haven't been pushed. Uh, to run the numbers they uh, as they have been pushed in other 
and other enterprises uh, to make the profitability they need to make the operation viable? I don't know. Um, or is it a lack of, you know, implementation of, of technology uh, that will help us increase uh, labour efficiency? So a few factors to consider there, but labour has been one of the biggest contributors. Um, but on top of that, there has been, you know, rises across the board in, in, in the other enterprise uh, categories as well. Another question here from Charles. Charles, thank you. Uh, is there any difference between self-replacing flocks and those that buy replacement ewes from the market? Charles, I'm very glad you asked that question because I am um, I'm very well prepared for it. Let me just pull that up for you. Let me just pull that up for you. Um, so Charles, you can see that graph there. We're just uh, off the back of the MLA uh, Southern Lamb situation analysis, which we uh, we were commissioned by MLA to conduct in 2017, and it's taking a historical look at the factors, you know, contributing to land profitability and, and limiting land profitability over the last five years since we did the uh, the 2013 situ Lamb situation analysis. Now. We, as a part of that report, we did do a comparison between self-replacing prime lamb flocks and those buying in replacements. Now, this graph here shows um, the performance of those uh, two different cohorts in 2016 and 2017. As you can see, um, uh, at the income at the income level. Um, buying and replacements has, has outperformed self-replacing slightly, uh, but the self-replacing flocks expenses have been a bit low, a bit lower air relative in both years. Now, the net effect is that at the profitability level, um, as you can see there, buying and replacements in 16 is about $10. Self-replacing is about $10. Uh, in 17, buying in, about $15 per hectare, uh, sorry, $15 a profit per DSC, and self-replacing is about the same again. So the net outcome of that uh, that particular analysis was that there was no real um, effect of, of whether you're buying in your replacement use or, 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 or running a self-replacing prime land flock um, over the long term. Well, in those two years at least, and, and we predict uh, over a longer term. So um, I hope that answers your question. But uh, as far as we're concerned, um, there's much more variation uh, in profitability due to other management factors within those two different those two different you know systems um, that affect profitability much more. So do one or the other. Uh, shouldn't worry. Shouldn't worry yourself. Shouldn't worry bank manager. And it certainly doesn't worry me. Just do it very well. Tim has asked a question here. Uh, what is the annual average DSE rating of a U in the top 20%? Tim, I suspect um, I, have to, I haven't actually, you know, knuckled down on that particular um, figure. Now, I don't, so I don't know um, because you're, Average DSE rating per U will will change from system to system. Um, I haven't calculated for the top 20%, uh, you know, versus versus the average. Um, presumably, presumably, um, look, I, I actually don't know, Tim. I'm not going to go there for fear of stuffing it up, um, but it could be something we need to look at. Uh, I don't suspect there will be. I don't suspect there'll be any major difference between the average and the top 20% that will be affecting profitability. Um, but it is it is a good question and it might be something I need to uh, dig around, fossil around in, and uh, see if I can come up with something. Thanks, Brad. Uh, sorry, Tim. Uh, 
Uh, Brad, really, uh, Brad, thanks for coming online. I know you're online last week and you're on online this week. Uh, Brad from Bambala, do you do you have do you have a blank budget and crop calculator in Excel format that is available for planning with the best benchmark targets include uh, to compare against? Uh, apologies, Brad, I we don't. Um, uh, if I'm interpreting your question correctly here, just let me have one more look at it. Sorry, Brad. No, it's 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 not something that we have a, a quick tick and flick uh, calculator for with these benchmarks. It's it's a good idea. Um, we'd we'd like to see obviously people participate in our benchmarking. Um, that way they they get their benchmarks you know uh, accurately and they get all the comparative data with it. Uh, that's 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 the service that would provide that outcome the best. But obviously it's uh, as you may know it's a, it's a bit bigger investment than just a a quick uh, a quick calculator on Excel. A good question here from Bruce. Uh, what impact has rising price of seed stock and replacement stock had on cost of production? Uh, Bruce, technically, it shouldn't have had any cost on cost of production. The reason being is that uh, replacement stock, um, whether, it be <clears throat> whether it be rams or buying in replacement ewes, uh, those metrics are gobbled up in the uh, sheep trading account. So meaning that um, if you can have to buy, you know, very, uh, very expensive rams, um, they come in and get devalued in the livestock trading account. And then, you know, at the end of their three or four years, they get sold out for a hundred bucks uh, to the, to, you know, for dog food then what that'll actually do is not increase your cost of production, it will actually decrease your income, uh, which is uh, an income is a, is a combination of, um, you know, your trading accounts, so your um, opening and your, your closing uh, minus opening uh, 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 livestock trading value and your sales and your purchases. So it will actually affect income or, or, or sheep or, or your actual uh, per DSE income of the prime lamp operation, not actually cost of production. Got a question here from Robbie. I'm just reading it. Robbie, efficient labour usage is about 7,000 uh, DSE uh, to 9,000 DSE per labour unit. How much work is contracted out with these efficiencies? So fencing, spraying, seeding, etc. How much work is included by the term labour efficiency, by the team labour efficiency, so presumably the on-farm labour. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, Robbie, good question. So yes, the labour labour productivity metrics that you've got there are, are quite um, quite aggressive. That's but that's good. Seven thousand DSC to nine thousand DSC per labour unit. Now that includes that actually includes all labour. That's shearers, crutches scanners, uh, the owner, operator, the managers, all the staff, um, even if they, you can stick your bookkeeper in there if you want to. But what portion of that labour efficiency is, is cut out between contractors and on-farm labour? Uh, look, that's not something I have up my sleeve right now, Robbie. It's a good question. I suspect, um, I suspect that there shouldn't be much difference uh, or it won't actually come up as a major um, contributor or, uh, or driver of land profitability because we attribute, um, you know, we attribute a fairly uh, respectful uh, owner operator's wage to, to those who are employed in the business, uh, in their own businesses. And that normally accounts for their labour fairly well. And we also attribute a, um, a fairly reasonable salary to all the subsequent uh, family operators or family uh, or owner labour units in that business. So uh, they they normally um, uh, you know contribute as much as employed labour 
to the cost of running an operation. Now, I think where the major differences would show up, I'm, I'm just saying uh, what could happen if, because I don't actually have the data with me, is that if you're a business that for somehow is managing to, to employ a, a maybe lower value labour or lower skilled labour to to run the business, then um, that would be, uh, you know, uh, employed on farm, maybe as part of the, the actual team, that farm would have, you know, presumably a higher profitability than those businesses that had to contract out that work at, you know, at contract rates, which we know um, some, you know, we know contractors get the job done uh, very quickly and very cleanly and they're in and out, um, but the actual per unit cost is is sometimes quite high uh, compared to doing it with um uh, owner own labor or um or employed labor given that you know you're suitably resourced and skilled to do the same task so there's a story in that i think robbie and in, in that if we can simplify our production systems essentially de-skill uh, the operation and are able to employ uh you know i wouldn't i, I won't uh, say cheap labor but labor uh, well, yeah, I will, I'll say cheap labour, probably lower skilled labour uh, that can, you know, happily operate uh, the different aspects that they need to within the business um, confidently. Uh, then that's that, and, you know, if that business is achieving the same levels of productivity, well, uh, you know, kudos to them because it's going to pan out in high profitability. Complex systems that need, you know, they need the boss there, otherwise they're going to fall down. Inevitably, they're going to be very hard to push um, uh, for labour, uh, well, they're going to need higher li- levels of labour efficiency, and um, labour is going to be a, um, a you know a, a big contributor to the overall cost structure. Now, Tim, yeah, Tim, you've come back to me, or maybe standard reference weight of use size, Tim. We don't, we don't, um, uh, we don't collect that data. You know, standard reference weight of the U is not collected. Um, so it's once again, I can't quite answer that question around uh, the DSC rating of the use or, or the standard reference weight apologies, but uh, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question though. <clears throat> Just looking through the questions here. Um, Apologies, I'm just finding where I'm up to. Um, Andrew, Andrew, thanks for participating tonight. Has this 2017 lamb situation analysis been published? Can I find it on the MLA website? <clears throat> um, I'm not sure, Andrew. It, it, you know, from our end, it should have been. It's been submitted. I suspect all the edits have been seen too. So uh, maybe we need to. You get onto them and make sure that they're making it publicly available. Uh, good question. Um, look, I'll um, I'll follow up with the uh, you know with the uh, the person on the MLA side of things to see where that's at. Thanks for that. Oliver's asked a question here. Given you are putting importance on per DSE uh, measurements, uh, why isn't home Sackett recording uh, reference body weights? Uh, great question, Oliver. I've come up against this question a few times, so I should be prepared uh, to, to answer it. Now, there's a, there's a few things I'd like you to consider. Um, number one is that uh, we don't have... Uh, uh, well, it's not that we don't have confidence, but benchmarking is just by nature a very blunt tool. We ask uh, of our participants a lot of a lot of information, and um, I think 75% of the participants uh, pull their hair out uh, at some stage through the data inputting. Um, wondering why we ask so much detail and how it's going to affect you know their business. Um, so with that said, we're not 
uh, overly sure that if we put in a, a the ability to uh, to vary DSE rating of the use and prime name operations that uh, we're going to get an accurate indication of what what those uh, you know we're not 100 percent sure that everyone's going to put in the, the correct standard reference weight I, I run lifetime year management courses i have been doing so for a number of years now and one thing that consistently surprises me is how producers will enter a different standard reference weight for their mob every session um, because they feel that their weight has gone either up or down and um, you know, subsequently we need to explain to them that it's actually the standard reference weight and it doesn't change, it's their reference weight at condition score three. So you're sort of relying on the producers to understand what, what uh, you know, what condition scores are, what a condition score looks like, uh, you know, and there's a lot of variation across industry of what people's perception of this is and not only understand that but know exactly what the weights are or the average weight of the flock and condition score three is. Um, We've opted not to go down that path for fear of further obfuscating the, the output and, 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 and in some instances reducing confidence because we're never quite sure. Um, we never get to eyeball the flocks and, and everyone who participates in the benchmarking don't get to eyeball the rest of the data, sort flock, uh, data sets flocks. So we don't want them to have, uh, you know, to erode confidence that uh, Joe Blow is putting his use in at um, you know, 50 kilos, so he's uh, or, or, or or 70 kilos, and he's getting uh, you know in, incredible uh, productivity per DSE, or, or or someone's putting their use in at 50 kilos, and obviously running a whole heap more DSEs because and and maybe not getting the same level of productivity. I've also looked into that um, analytically at, at you know with the actual benchmarking data. And there have been some groups um, that we've worked with that have questioned the standard reference weight of the of the U. Um, what what we've found is that um, I think it's a a seven percent uh, a seven percent change. Um, oh look, I can't quite remember. I think it's about a a seven percent change um, in in DSE or energy requirements per ten kilograms of standard reference weight. Now, what, what the outcome of, of looking at it with particular groups was that no, even if we built in um, the different standard reference weights of, the, of their sheep, it actually rarely made any impact on where they ranked in priority of profitability or uh, profitability per DSC and obviously all the productivity figures uh, across the group. So what the, what the outcome was is that even if we did sort of go down to that level of accuracy, it wasn't going to change the key, um, the key messages that were flowing out from uh, from those particular benchmarks to to those people. So, great question. I hope that's gone some way of answering it. And I know how important um, productivity per or production per kilo of grass eaten is. Um, now. Uh, I don't. I don't suspect benchmarking is going to um, a, a accurately tease that apart. And I think that the messages that it produces are still important. Um, and and if you do look at, um, you know, the, the the relationship between production or productivity per DSC and per hectare, there's still a fairly strong relationship between the two. So, um, uh, you know, the messages are still uh, still fairly sound. Okay, we've got a fair few more questions coming through. Thanks everyone for dropping these questions in. I hope uh, I'm not pulling any, putting anyone to sleep uh, with my uh, monotone voice here, but I'm just doing my best to to keep on top of them. Uh, Self-replacing flocks joining ewes as lambs from Bob. Bob, yes, a lot of them are. And uh, joining ewe lambs is actually a key um, contributor to per DSE productivity. It's 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 it's. Uh, I, I encourage you to go back and watch Sandy McEachran's um, webinar on uh, optimal prime lamb flock structure. Now you'll find that on the Making More From Sheep website underneath resources. It talks a lot to joining ewe lambs and ewe lambs are a bit of the Achilles heel. They need to be joined to make sure you achieve those per DSC productivity figures, but you definitely don't want 
too many ULAMs in the system. And, and actually, if you can run your, uh, if you if you can find ways to minimise the reliance on you on ULAM fertility, um, that will uh, you know go some way to increasing the production of your flock. Um, Georgina, paid labour doesn't work the hours that family labour does. Um, good point. Uh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe not. We do have. We've got a fair few managers that we work with, Georgina, and and um, you know some of them do their five day week or six and, or five and a half day weeks. But there are managers out there that do uh, some fairly big hours as well. So um, something to think about there. Uh, thanks, Tim. A bit of positive feedback with a thumbs up. I don't know how you did a thumbs up, Tim. That's uh, that's great. I've never seen that done on a webinar chat like this, but um, it's really good. Um, sheep, uh, a question here from Philip. Should cost production incorporate land values as this could impact stocking rates as a reflection of the carrying capacity irrespective of rainfall? Should cost reduction incorporate land values as it could impact stocking rates as a reflection of carrying capacity irrespective of rainfall? Philip, I, I hesitate to agree. Uh, the reason being is that land values in some instances reflect uh, the land quality, i.e., you know, you might uh, 900 mil rainfall in some pretty steep country. It might be you know fifteen hundred dollars an acre where as uh, eight hundred mil rainfall um, in 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 uh, on the flats around Mansfield uh, definitely translates into a lot higher production. I'm not confident that the market um, can accurately or rationally determine the productivity of the land of uh, to you know obviously it does to a certain extent but there's so many confounding figures we've got uh, very strong uh, groups working with us say around Molong and Orange Bathurst and um, you know if we put them it, you know they some of them are actually excellent producers and are achieving a very competitive productivity per DS uh, sorry per per hectare uh, across a range of enterprises, not prime land specifically, but um, if you put in their land values, they'd be crucified because you know everybody wants to get a coffee um, in 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 uh, you know in orange before they slip out and uh, check their cattle. Um, it's just the nature of the land and and grossly over or grossly inflated due to the real estate value of that area. So uh, it's uh, one thing to uh, you know. Uh, to consider, but I think we're best sticking with um, that that figure per hectare per hundred mil rainfall at the moment. We we don't have a I don't think there is a better uh, indicator than 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 that. And if there was, we'd be using it. Uh, question from James. James, when you say supplementary feeding costs are increasing, is it for use before? And during lambing or finishing lambs over the summer, James. Great question. Uh, really good question. Now I can't pull that apart for you right here. Uh, I suspect there'll obviously be a little bit of both. Um, the feed base costs. If if we were just to uh, think laterally about that particular issue, we are seeing a increased weight spec for lambs and, and, and lamb weights are increasing slightly. Uh, they've plateaued in, in recent times, but they have increased. And uh, you'd suspect that a lot of that has come on the back of incre increased investment in uh, summer pastures. And, and there's better science out there and more management expertise around managing summer-based, uh, high-quality summer-based pastures. So some of that cost uh, definitely would be in finishing lambs over the summer. Thanks, James. And Robbie's come back to me uh, on some of my comments. I hope I'm not going to be uh, regretting what I said, Robbie. Okay, so efficient labour usage doesn't necessarily correlate with overhead costs and capital costs, such as owning the cedar and paying an employee less per hour than a contractor may pay him or herself per hour.
the okay I think Robbie this is a yeah, this is a good question if I'm interpreting it right I think I am um, there's definitely the ability for people to shift uh, costs within the benchmarking uh, based on you know basically how the systems are run so we need to understand that um, an operation will have higher uh, salary or higher employee or, or, or labour costs um, if they employ their own labour in the woolshed say so they contribute they, they put their own staff in as rousies maybe classes and even pressing and uh, getting the sheep to and from the catching pens so those those businesses will have higher labor costs per DSC, but intuitively you know those costs will be subtracted from or not showing up in the shearing cost per head um, so that's one thing to, to consider so you can um, just note based on the nature of businesses certain costs can be shifted around and you know likewise um, uh, you know, you can have very high contractor costs and low labour costs, uh, low owner and employed labour costs, um, but then you can have um, uh, low contractor costs and high depreciation because you own the spray unit and you, you've got your man in it or, or, or your employee drive-in. Um, I might have to take a rain check on that, Robbie. I'm just struggling to uh, to answer that confidently. But in essence, in essence, um, I could say this: that if you have latent capacity in the business, um, i.e., you have you're not operating at 100% or at optimal labor le uh, levels of labor productivity, then there's definitely scope to engage your current labor or your latent capacity into tasks that would have been otherwise done, you know, through through a contractor. And that may, you know, that may see some tasks, the time frame of some tasks blow out. Uh, you get a crutching trailer in with four crutches, you'll soon knock over, um, you know, you, you, you'll do a, you, you do a couple of thousand ewes in, in a day. However, if you have to sit up and do them, saddle up and do them with employed labour, it might take much longer. But if the employed labour comes out at a, you know, at a cheaper or you know uh, absorbs that employed labour, then um, in fact you're better off using it and taking longer on the task uh, than employing the contractors on a piece rate. So something to consider there. Robbie, I might have to uh, be in touch with you after the webinar to make sure we've got that uh, question nailed. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, well, that seems to be the uh, end of the questions. If there's any other questions, uh, please um, jump online and flick them through now. Otherwise, keep an eye out on your email and your text. We've got another webinar next week. I'd love to see you on board there. Uh, Tim Prance is a great, great man, had a, a lot of experience in pasture productivity, fertiliser programs, working both in industry and in private practice. So he's going to be a wealth of knowledge. Uh, don't be afraid to jot down any criticism or compliments in the post webinar survey we do take notice of that and, and look forward to reviewing that um, on behalf of MLA I'd like to thank you for participating in tonight's webinar and um, this is your levies in action and uh, we're happy to uh, we want to make sure that you, uh, the industry gets as much value out of it as possible um, please if you've got friends or family that you think would benefit let them know about the webinars get them online get them to register and, and uh, we'll see them here at the next session Thanks for participating on behalf of MLA. Thank you. And on behalf of Home Sacket, the webinar coordinators, thank you. And um, we'll be in touch. Uh, see you next week.